Good morning. Welcome to Christmas at the Movies. We are glad that you're here at all of our campuses. And I just, we'll get back to the story in just a second. But I've got to say, if you came through any of our lobbies, the one here in South Barrington, the one in Chicago, the one in Crystal Lake, at all of our campuses, you saw a lot of fun, a lot of surprises. Um, there's going to be a lot of treats and surprises over the next few weeks. And none of that could have happened without hundreds of hours of volunteers. Can we just give it up at all of our campuses for all the volunteers that made that work? That is going to be so fun. I love it. And we are looking at a few Christmas, uh, classic Christmas movies. We're looking at It's a Wonderful Life. We're looking at The Grinch, Rudolph. Uh, I tried for Die Hard. I tried, okay? I will say this, if you look really hard in all of our lobbies, you can find John McClain hanging off of Nakatomi Plaza. If you look really closely, I was able to get that in. But today, we are looking at the story of Elf. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, where have you been, okay? Uh, go and see the movie, it's so good. Um, this is basically the story of Will Ferrell, Buddy the Elf, okay? And he gets adopted when he's a kid and he's raised as an elf. He's a human being, full-size human being, but he's living in the North Pole, elf land, and as he gets bigger, everything just starts to go wrong. He doesn't fit anymore. It's causing lots of problems, and at some point, Santa comes to him and says, hey, buddy, we need to let you know uh, you were actually adopted. You're a human, and of course, he's surprised about this, and he says, and your father is living in New York City. And Buddy gets super excited about this and goes off uh, on an adventure to meet his real family, his real father in New York City. The problem is because Buddy has only known the joy of Christmas cheer in the North Pole, things get a little awkward when he gets to New York City. Here's a clip of him meeting his dad for the first time. Dad! So awkward, so awkward. He's coming home and he wants Christmas to be this incredible family reunion, this incredible family experience. But what we find is that through um, some syrup on some spaghetti and through some uh, rapid fire snowball fights and all kinds of mayhem, it ends up being a really chaotic family Christmas experience. And so we'll jump off there and begin to look at a person in the Bible who I'm sure wanted their first Christmas experience with their family to be a wonderful experience, but instead finds an incredibly chaotic situation. His name is Joseph. I'm in Matthew 1. I'm going to read this to you. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind he was going to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he's going to save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God 
with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, you may read that and say it seems pretty calm and quick to resolution, but understand that Joseph's got a pretty stressful Christmas situation there with his family. Now, let's pause right there. We're at the beginning of the Christmas season. How's the stress in your family? Okay, because this is the month of the year that we decide we're going to write a letter, try and get a nice picture of our family, and write a letter to every human being we have ever known in our entire life, right? This is the season that we will bake homemade cookies, decorate them, and then hand deliver them to everybody that we know. This is the season that we will buy presents for all the people that we love, and actually, if we're honest, a few people that we don't like all that much. (laughs) This is the season that we do more religious services, more generosity, more charity moments than ever before. This is the moment that we we get really, really busy, and then... (laughs) Halfway through, we let the kids out of school. Whose idea was that? (laughs) Christmas can be a very stressful time. In fact, some British doctors did a study, and do you know that 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve, you are 37% more likely to have a heart attack than any other time of the year? Are you kidding me? We are stressed out. They call it the Christmas coronary. That is a scary deal. It can be a very, very stressful time. So that we have this idea, just like Buddy, just like Joseph, I'm sure that we want our family experience to be this, I don't know, Norman Rockwellian, beautiful, meaningful, connected moment with our families. And if we're not careful, we wake up on the other side of New Year's exhausted And honestly, Christmas was basically just a blur. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a look over the shoulder of Joseph as he navigates this first Christmas and see if we can learn a few things about how to deal with family in a chaotic Christmas season. First thing Joseph does, it says, or mentions about him, is he focuses on this right relationship with God. In verse 19... It says, it mentions that Joseph is a righteous man. Now, that's not just any normal adjective. In Jewish culture, they would refer to someone in this particular way. This is a Greek phrase that indicated something unique, something special about Joseph. And that is that he was a tzaddik. Everybody at all of our campuses say tzaddik. Ready? One, two, three, tzaddik. It's kind of a T-S-A D-I-Q word. Now, what does that mean? How can I explain it? Well, um, I, uh, I, I went to Catholic high school. Any Catholics with us? We've got Catholics in the house. Peace be with you. Also with you. Now it's with your spirit. They've updated it a little bit. So if you haven't been back in a while, when you go back, you can, you know, it's with your spirit. Um, but here's the thing. Um, we went to New York City uh, just recently with the family, and we did all of, the, uh, all of the tourist kinds of things. We went to Empire State Building. We went to Rockefeller Plaza. But we took the kids into St. Saint, uh, Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Beautiful. And our kids, I'd been in you know, the Catholic experience. My kids had never experienced a church like that. And they walked in and they see this incredible building with the pipe organ and the stained glass. And they, you know, it was just a foreign experience to them. And we're sitting down uh, in the pew. And my son reaches down. I'm not going to tell you which one. But my son reaches down and he grabs the kneeler and he puts it down. And he looks over at me and he says, what's this, Dad? And I said, well, that's a kneeler. And can you believe he looked at me and said, what's it for? I'm like, pray for my kids, okay? I mean, it's not just a clever name. You know, it's a kneeler. You kneel on it. You pray, right? Here's the thing. When, when, I, was, when I was in the Catholic world, um, it was like everybody was Catholic, 
And you were Catholic because you kind of, uh, you, 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 you were born into it almost like. Your, your dad was Catholic, your mom was Catholic, so you were just Catholic. But if somebody was really Catholic, they would say this phrase. They would say, you know what? He's very devout, Right? Or she's very devout. And what they meant by that is that it wasn't a cultural thing for them. It wasn't just, you know, to, to something that their family did. It was something that was meaningful to them. This was somebody that took their relationship with God very seriously. They were devout. And that's what it meant in the Jewish culture when you said somebody was a tzaddik. He was a righteous Man, And what we're going to find is that the fact that he had a real relationship with God, watch, he knew God, he'd met God, that impacts the way he navigates Christmas. Now, just because it's fun, watch this. Okay, so go with me on this, okay? Because I know it's a stretch, but it's a fun stretch. He knows Santa, so he's got joy, right? And the truth is, in the same way that he sits there and has all this joy, all this Christmas cheer, this Christmas spirit, even in the midst of people who don't have any, <laughs> even in a situation where there's not a lot of Christmas cheer, he's able to have some why, because he's met Santa, right? And he's only met Santa, when you've experienced the love of God, well, then you're able to, to, to share that love with other people. When you've experienced the forgiveness of God because you've got a real relationship with them, and you've experienced the forgiveness of God, then you're able to extend grace and peace and forgiveness to other people. And yeah, when you know God, there's supposed to be what the Bible calls an inexpressible and glorious joy. You talk about the Christmas cheer, you talk about the Christmas spirit, that's what it's talking about, the inexpressible and glorious joy of knowing God. You, you've probably heard this before, H happiness and joy, those are different things. Happiness with the same root word as, as the word happening or happenstance, it's, it's based on your circumstances. So that if you go through this Christmas season and you find a great deal on a Christmas present, well, that's a good circumstance, so you're happy. Or the kids were able to keep their, their Christmas clothes nice and they got a nice picture with Santa and they didn't cry at all. Well, you walk away from that and you're happy. But if your circumstances aren't that way, if things get a little chaotic in your family, if your circumstances change, well then happiness can just go away. But joy is based on something deeper. Joy is based on your relationship with God. It's literally, I mean, I my story is that I grew up kind of a cultural Christian. You just did it because your parents did it. You did it because it was just what everybody you knew did. It wasn't until I saw people, Christians, that were going through some of the hard things that I was going through, and yet they were going through them with joy and peace. And I was watching that and going, that's not my experience, and I want that. 
That's what made all the difference. You know, happiness is mentioned about 27 times in the Bible, but joy is referred to 320 times in the Bible. Joy is where it's at. So what can you do to increase your joy? What can you do to focus on that relationship with God? Well, around here, we've been talking about rooted rhythms, the, the spiritual practices that can help you grow closer to God. So, you know, maybe for you, it's, it's daily devotional. Uh, there's 24 chapters in the Christmas story. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, there's 24 chapters. You could go home today and start in chapter 1 and finish the story of Jesus right around Christmas time. Generosity is one of the spiritual practices. I saw all kinds of pictures of people in our church packing hope packs yesterday on social media and all that kind of thing. Do you know what I didn't see in any of the pictures? A frown. There wasn't one person that was going, oh, here we got to do this chore. There was a spirit of generosity that produced these smiles, this, this joy. And what does Buddy say? He says, the greatest way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. Have you seen the movie? And they start singing, and the next thing you know, all of New York City is singing, and they've got Christmas cheer. I think there's something to coming to church and singing together, worshiping together. Certainly, when you come on Christmas Eve, man, there's going to be some amazing things happening here. And all of that to help us focus on our relationship with God. It's a great way to help navigate some of the chaos in our family at Christmas time. Can I give you a second one? As I look at the life of Joseph, he demonstrated grace in reaction to a stressful situation demonstrated grace um, if you can imagine you live in a really really small town it's a town where everybody kind of knows everybody's name and everybody knows everybody's business too right and and you're engaged to this girl and the truth is pretty much everybody in the town is going to be at the wedding and it's kind of the the, the social the social uh, occasion of the year and everybody's looking forward to it and 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 one night you are dropping your girl off at the doorstep and she stops and she says hey wait a second i need to tell you something i'm pregnant and this is a religious town. This is a town where that kind of thing is not going to fly, and everybody's going to hear about it. And, and, and so you, you think to yourself, well, hold on a second. Now, girls, like, you shouldn't joke about things like that. And then you lock eyes with her, and you realize, like, she's not joking. And next thing you know, you feel this pit in your stomach that begins to sort of churn and rumble and, and sort of erupts into this anger and disillusionment and discouragement and disappointment and you lied to me and you know you 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 cheated on me I mean just imagine what that was like in that moment and guys here's the deal how would you react how would you respond in Joseph's culture especially with a Sadiq an upright person the the proper response would have been to deliver her to execute her stone her and deliver her to the, the doorstep of her father's home. That was the law. But this is what Joseph did in verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. In other words, instead of disgrace, he gives grace. Now, I hope at Christmas time you don't have a circumstance anywhere close to what Joseph is dealing with. But I will tell you this. Over the course of this month, someone is going to disappoint you. Over the course of this month, someone is going to treat you wrong. Someone is going to get impatient and try and pick a fight with you. Someone is going to uh, not live up to the expectations that you have. And let's be honest, that someone is probably sitting very close to you right now, right? 
And if they're not, here's the deal. Grandpa's going to come, and around the Christmas, uh, Christmas table, he's going to talk about politics again, and there's going to be a war zone that's going to happen. How are you going to react? It was Christmas Eve, 1914. We were five months into World War I. 800,000 troops had been killed or injured. And at one point, the British soldiers put up above the trenches a sign that said, Merry Christmas. And slowly but surely, the artillery shells began to stop flowing. The the bullets stopped flying. And the soldiers on both sides, against orders, climbed out of the trenches and walked through the battlefield, shook each other's hands, exchanged some Christmas gifts. They had some candy that they gave each other, some cigars and some cigarettes. In fact, at one point along the line, there was even a soccer game that got played. The Germans won three, three to two. <laughs> and then Christmas morning dawned, and they had to all kind of go back into their trenches, but they wouldn't fight anymore. In fact, they had to bring in new troops and order them to start fighting Again, now why do I share that with you? Because Jesus can bring peace to a battlefield. And Jesus can bring peace to your family chaos as well. Some of you are saying, but you, you don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand what's happened. You don't know how long this has gone on. And I say, yeah, that's the very reason that we need God's help. Because human forgiveness, human grace, it, it, it runs out. That's why we've got to. I mean, whoever you are, whatever you, whether you're a church person or not, like, get with God because you need that kind of grace. You need, if you're going to be able to forgive other people, you need that kind of forgiveness and grace from God. In fact, I, I picked up a, a prayer. Of, uh, I've tried to teach it wherever I go. It is, it, it's because I, I learned it from Andy Stanley. He would, he would pray a prayer with his kids, and I kind of added to it a little bit. But he, here was the prayer. As my kids were growing up and we'd tuck them in at night, it was, dear God, give us the wisdom to know what's right. And I would touch them on different parts of their body to try and help them remember this. Dear God, give us the wisdom to know what's right. Give us the courage to do what's right. And help us to say the right things with our mouth and do the right things with our hands, even when it's hard. And I think the power of it really comes in that last part, even when it's hard. The recognition that I couldn't do it on my own. I need God's help. And so maybe that's a prayer you begin to pray as well this Christmas. (laughs) We're about to have the family over. Dear God, give me the wisdom to know how to handle this. Give me the courage. To do it and help me to say the right things with my mouth and maybe sometimes not say anything with my mouth and help me to do the right things with my hands, God, even when it gets hard. Well, what's amazing about Joseph is that he ends up doing the right things with his mouth and his hands and he's got the courage to do the right things. And if you look up at verses 20, 23 again, God sends an angel and basically confirms to Joseph that he's on the right track. He, he basically says to Joseph, no, what she told you is true. It's not a lie. And you can just imagine Joseph just going, oh, he's relieved. Like she really is the girl that, that he thought she was. She's not lying to him. Like this is a, a privileged position that God is, is, is bringing his son into the world through this Girl, I mean, this is somebody that I don't have to leave her behind. I don't, have to, I don't have to dismiss her. We can still name a really risky football pass after her. Like, she's a very special lady. And that brings us to the third way that Joseph handles his family Christmas chaos. One, he really focused on his relationship with God. He, number two, he tried to react or respond with grace. 
And then the third thing I see with Joseph is that he begins to influence his family toward God and his plan. Look at verse 24. It says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. So he, he carried out what was supposed to happen. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And then he gave him the name Jesus, which we know means God saves. It's as if in those couple verses that, that Joseph was saying, okay, well then, then I'm going to do my part in this family to move us toward what God would have us do and really to God himself. And guys, I think no matter who you are, no matter what your personality is, no matter kind of what your place is in the family, if you're the young one, the old one, if you're the, the man, the woman, if you're the person that hasn't been back to the reunion for a while, or whatever it is, I want to encourage you, as God leads, what would it look like for you to influence your family toward God and his plan this Christmas? In creative ways, in small ways, maybe in bold ways at times, what might that look like? You know, my mother was not a loud person. She was um, a helper. Uh, she loved to host events. She loved to serve. She didn't say a lot. But my mother was, was a, a tactician at this. She was amazing at this. Her, our, our extended family, they weren't all Christians. And when it was mom's turn to, to host Christmas, I remember the first year that she suggested, hey, um, what if we all prayed before we ate the Christmas meal together? And you can just see my uncles like, you know, like this. But guess what? We prayed. Now, I remember the year that my mother said, hey, um, before we do the gifts, what if, what if we just read the Christmas story? What are you going to say? No. And so we read the Christmas story. My dad did. And I remember growing up, my mother... Um, I remember the, the year that we were teenagers, my brother and I, and, and she said, I would like to take you boys down to the school for the blind and help them wrap Christmas gifts. And I thought, I've got video games over here, mother. Don't have time for that. And do you know, such rich memories of going and trying to help people wrap their presents. Now, I will say this. I'm not a very good rapper. And uh, I have a feeling that those, even though they were, uh, had a tough time seeing, I have a feeling, let me just say I was grateful that they couldn't see what I came up with. All right? <laughs> but look at this passage in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Always remember these commands I give you. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road. Talk about them when you lie down and, and when you get up. In other words, as you go through your Christmas season, just pepper your conversations and your days with God. What, what could it look like for you to influence your family this Christmas? I'll share this with you. Um, there's a lot of effort going into trying to create an atmosphere that anybody from your family, whether they're Christians or not, or whether young or old, that any of them could enjoy coming during this series, and especially on Christmas Eve. And can I encourage you, whether you're here, you might be here for the first time, can I encourage you to think about inviting someone as a way to influence your friends and family toward God this Christmas. You know, 50% of people that you invite to come to church will come to church. That's the statistic. But that number goes up at Christmas time, and that number goes up if you already have a relationship with somebody. See, I know that years from now, there'll be people that will be baptized, and they'll point back to an invitation that they got from some of the people that are hearing my voice right now. Let me close this way. Um, uh, Jonathan uh, 
Jonathan was 22 months old when he can, uh, uh, when he got meningitis. And the meningitis had a few effects on him. Um, it left him developmentally behind. It made it so that he couldn't detect danger. So that as he was growing up, a, a, a toddler, three years old, five years old, he, he couldn't detect fire. He couldn't figure out, I could fall off of this thing. You can just imagine what his life was like. And then thirdly, the meningitis left him mute. He wasn't able to speak. His two-year-old birthday came. His parents had never heard a word. Three years old, four years old. He was five years old. And it was Christmas time at his family. In fact, it was after Christmas, and his mother and father were taking down the lights. They, they were packaging the ornaments. And for the very first time, they heard Jonathan speak. And he said the words, why can't we be all year like we are right now? And his parents looked at each other and they put the lights back up and they put the ornaments back on the tree. And Jonathan is 40 years old right now and that family has celebrated Christmas every day since that time. And Jonathan's developing and, and he's doing fine. But it begs the question, these things that we focus on only at Christmas time, these things that warm our hearts during this season, why can't we be all year like we are right now? Maybe the, the things that we talked about today, uh, connecting with God in a real way, why can't we be like that all year long? We think about being peacemakers, extending grace to others, forgiveness, to others but let's be like that all year long and let's try to influence people especially the ones we love towards God all year long I do love Elf it's a great movie but I will say this there is one way there is one way in which the story of Elf Elf is exactly opposite to the plot of the Christmas story, the real Christmas story, and that's this way. Elf is a story about a son who went on a journey to try and find his real dad. And the Christmas story is about your heavenly father who goes on a rescue mission and sends his one and only son to save his kids. Jesus was born on Christmas. He grew up and lived a sinless life. He taught us about God. And then one day, he allowed himself to be mocked, beaten, whipped, and told to carry a cross up a hill. He allowed himself to be nailed to that cross, taking on upon himself the punishment that we deserve, that our sins deserve, he died that day but three days later he rose again he overcame the consequences of sin he overcame sin and death and because he was both God and man his sacrifice his resurrection earns him the right to be able to offer an invitation to you and to me and to say if you will put your faith in Jesus and accept him as your Lord and Savior, then you can have your sins forgiven and you can live with God forever. That's the gospel. That is the good news of Christmas. If you're here today watching at any of our campuses, we're going to sing one last song. And when we do, as soon as we begin to sing, we'll stand in just a second and we'll sing. And when we do, I just want to invite you. If you want to say yes to Jesus, there's going to be people down front at all of our campuses that want to pray with you, that want to help you in any way that they can. Uh, if you want to be baptized today, we can make that happen. Uh, during this song, you, 
You may sit right where you are, stand right where you are, and you may sing this song, and you may say, you know what, my next step with God is, I'm just going to come back next week. How awesome is that? Your next step with God might be to love your neighbor like Jesus taught us to love our neighbor. Your next step might be, hey, I, I want to think about somebody to invite to church next week. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to take a next step with Jesus. 